Michigan Out of Doors Online is brought to you in part by... By Huron Lady River Cruises in Port Huron, offering daily sightseeing trips and private cruises. Sightseers will experience the International Blue Water Bridges, Great Lakes Freighters, the Fort Gratiot Lighthouse, and more. Huron Lady River Cruises on the web at HuronLady.com. Hey everybody, welcome to Michigan Out of Doors. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We have got a brand new show, and we're going to be showing you all sorts of different things that you can be doing this time of the year. One thing that folks are doing right now is getting their trail cameras in the woods. Fall is not that far away, and folks want to know what those deer are doing out there in the woods. Well, we're going to show you this week how to use them, where to set them up, kind of some of the new features that are on some of the new trail cameras. Lots of good information there. We're also going to head above the bridge on this week's show, and let you know what a few sportsmen up in Iron County are doing to improve their fishing habitat. And speaking of fishing, we're going to stop in with one of the coolest lure collections you've ever seen. Lots of good stuff on this week's show. You stay tuned. I'm Jimmy Gretzinger. It's time for Michigan Out of Doors. From the first spring rains to the soft summer breeze Dancing on the pine forest floor The autumn colors catch your eyes Here come the crystal winter skies It's Michigan, Michigan out of doors Someday our children all will see This is their finest legacy The wonder and the love of Michigan As the wind comes whispering through the trees the sweet smell of nature's in the air from the great lakes to the quiet stream shining like a sportsman's dream it's the love of michigan we all share michigan out of doors is presented by by greenstone farm credit services making recreational land ownership possible across michigan and northeast wisconsin Begin your land financing journey at one of Greenstone's 37 locations or visit greenstonefcs.com. By Meyer, a destination for hunting, fishing, and camping. From bug spray and tents to GPS and gas, Meyer has nearly everything you need to take on nature and get you there. Meyer. By G5 Outdoors, makers of the Quest and Prime Bows. Manufactured and designed in Memphis, Michigan, G5 offers archery bows, broadheads, and accessories on the web at g5outdoors.com. By Country Smokehouse, offering a variety of meat products, Country Smokehouse is located three miles south of I-69 on M53, just south of Imlay City. Country Smokehouse is a meat processor, a butcher, and a destination for sportsmen. Hi, I'm Jordan Brown, and for this week's show, Gabe Van Warmer and I were able to get out here and look at some of the new trail cameras on the market, as well as give you some pointers on when and where to set these cameras. All right, well, there's been big advancements in the trail cam industry in the last 10 years, even in the last five years, there's been big improvement Heck, when Jimmy Gretzinger started working for Michigan Outdoors, they didn't even have trail cameras. That's how far they've come in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, some of the big improvements that you're going to notice on some of the newer models, this has really been the last couple of years, but now basically everybody has switched to AA batteries, and that's a big improvement if you ran trail cameras over the last few years and had to deal with C batteries or D batteries. One, they get expensive, and two, they don't put up with the cold. So you start running these trail cameras in November and December, and you really weren't getting a lot of battery life out of them. Another big improvement that we've seen in these trail cameras is the SD card. Thankfully, we've switched over to that. I can remember the first trail cameras where you had to use film and you were looking at getting 24 or 36 pictures a, a roll. Now you can get thousands. So that does a couple of things. One, it keeps you out of your hunting area. You're not checking your trail cams near as often. Uh, the other thing it does is it allows you to get more pictures of the same deer. You can set these cameras up for burst mode. They say take several pictures at a time. Um, you can set them up to take pictures very frequently. You know, the old cameras, a lot of them, the quickest you could take another picture was a minute apart. Now you can get these all the way down to five seconds. You can take pictures apart. You get the super quick trigger speed nowadays in these newer cameras. Um, you know, you used to have deer when they'd walk by it, you'd only get the, the rear end of the deer. Now you can get a deer that runs by the camera and these cameras can catch it that fast. We're talking less than a second for the trigger speed on some of these cameras. Another big improvement in these trail cameras is the quality of the photos. I can remember the couple of the first trail cameras I got that they had three megapixel pictures and that was a big deal and at night a lot of them only had just over a megapixel or so so you're getting pretty poor image quality. 
Uh, nowadays, a lot of these cameras, 8, 10 megapixels, which is really incredible for what they are. And, that, and everything that these cameras do to still produce that high quality of an image is really, really cool. So today we have several different models of cameras. We're not going to go through every one in detail, but we're going to show you some of the features that you get uh, for your money. Okay, because a lot of these trail cameras are a couple hundred dollars, some of them are only eighty dollars. So what's all that mean? We're going to kind of go through that and show you what you get for that additional money. Okay, well first one we're going to look at is a top of the line trail camera. So this is a top of the line stealth cam here. Now what makes this a top of the line camera? Uh, a couple of things. You're going to get the 10 megapixel pictures, which is extremely high quality. Uh, there is adjustable uh, megapixels on here. If you want to take it down to like a 6 megapixel picture or an 8 megapixel picture, that's just going to allow you to get more images on your card. Another really cool thing about this camera in particular is it has a time lapse mode. Now, a lot of people have heard of like the Plot Master cameras um, where you can put it on a food plot and it takes a picture every so often. This camera can do that, and while it's doing that, if it detects motion, it will also take a picture just like it would under its normal function. So that's a pretty cool feature. Um, it's got some little things. It's got the LCD screen out front so you can see how many images it's taken. Um, none of that stuff is as big as the image quality and uh, the trigger speed on this camera really takes an incredible image. All right, well, the next trail camera we have here is another stealth cam. And this is a really cool camera. Um, this is the entire package. Okay, we got batteries, SD card, all comes with the camera. Now what's the difference between this camera and the upper end camera? It's pretty simple. Okay, every step you take down in these cameras, you're getting a few less megapixels. You don't get quite the same illumination out of these lower end cameras as you do the upper end. But it all depends on where you're using them. If you're putting these on a, a bait pile or a mineral lick or something, Maybe it's better to have a couple of the cheaper ones so you can scout a couple more spots than have one of the good ones. Now if you're putting it on a trail, maybe you want to go to an upper end camera so you get a little better quality pictures and out of a moving animal instead of something where it's on a mineral or on a bait pile. Um, all in all, I mean this is still a great little camera. It all depends on what you're looking for and where you want to set these trail cameras. Well you bought your trail camera, it's in your bag, now where in the world do you put this thing? That's the million dollar question when it comes to the summer. Um, we have to have these on a feeding program. Deer in the summer are going from bed to feed, feed to bed. So that we want to get these cameras in between that area and that can be really tough to do. If you're near a house you can legally put down some minerals so that they'll come to the minerals. That's a very good way to get an index of what you have in your areas. Now setting up these cameras it really depends on what kind of a camera you have. If you're setting up something on a trail, as Jordan said before, you have to have something with a lot of LED lights like this one. Um, and if you don't, you're gonna get a lot of blurry pictures of deer walking by. So you need to have something that has a lot of illumination on it. If you don't, blurry pictures. If you set it over minerals or you set it over a scrape area, you're gonna get deer that are a little more still. Uh, even in a food plot, deer aren't moving near as much. So that'll be a good one where you can set a little cheaper trail camera and you can have more of them because they're cheaper. So in the summer, I like to set mine between bedding and feeding areas, um, especially the feeding areas, and then also over minerals if that's allowable in your neck of the woods. Um, when it comes to September, when deer start going hard horn or when they're done growing and they're before they shed their velvet, I like to move all my trail cameras to uh, licking branches and mock scrapes. Deer will hit a scrape in the middle of the summer. So if you have a food plot and you make a mock scrape on it, you can actually get deer hitting it all summer long. In fact, the does, the fawns, everything will hit it. It's unbelievable how good a, a licking branch or a mock scrape is in or near a food plot or even a bedding area. Um, the major thing is we don't want to be in their bedding area while they're there. So if you choose to put one in a bedding area, you have to do it when they're gone. The only time they're gone is in the middle of the night. So there has been times where I've done that, gone and set up a trail camera in a bedding area and then gone back to check it in the middle of the night, but it's very difficult to do. So feeding areas or transition areas are a better bet um, any time of the year. Well, what do you look for in a camera? I know Jordan went over some of the features of cameras. I look for certain different things. When I'm using a trail camera in the winter, I have big heavy gloves on and trying to get these latches open can be very, very tough. This is a stealth cam. This is one of their upper line models and it is super easy to get these latches open and get them unbuttoned. Um, some of those are just difficult to get at. This takes an SD card. 
What I like on these new ones is some of the quick sets. This one has a couple different quick sets you can use, so you can just pull up, throw it on a tree, hit that quick set, and you can just click it there, and it's ready to go. This camera here just happens to have three different quick sets, and I've been using them on and off through the summer doing a little bit of testing. Another thing I like to do is uh, during the year, I love to put it on video mode, watching those deer rake their antlers. Sometimes you can get a better look at a deer's antlers and how he's moving around, his body type and what he is if you have it on video mode. Another thing is if I'm doing some trapping or anything, I can set up a trail camera on my traps and see what's getting into my traps and getting away that I didn't happen to get. So trail cameras can be used in a lot of different ways and uh, the new ones out on the market are unbelievable. Well, here's my trail cam backpack and it, I find it easier if you have a system when you walk up to the street. On the sides of my trail cam backpack, I have my trail cameras themselves. I have another one on this side. I have ones inside. Inside this, I have some mineral rock in case I'm near my house or a, a place that it's legal to do that. Um, inside the inside pockets I have a big pack of batteries I have something to hold the SD cards um, SD cards you've got to have a bunch of them you want to be able to walk up to your camera change the SD card and get out of that area so you're not screwing up your your hunt I have a padded case so it doesn't break I'm bouncing this around on my uh, four-wheeler or anything it's not gonna break I have a little camera to view my photos so that I make sure that the trail camera is working correctly and I want to check them in the field right next to the tree and if I need to make any adjustments I want to make them right there so I don't have to come back into the area. Inside this, this camera pouch is a little pouch right here. As soon as I check them with the camera I put the, the cards in this pouch and I'm able to keep them separate. I don't know how many times I've taken a used card, put it back in the camera and totally forgot about it. Way to go Gabe. Well, I hope we've given you a few trail camera tips that you can use to be more effective this fall. For our next story on this week's show, I was over on the west side of the UP near the Crystal Falls area to highlight a husband and wife going above and beyond to help create more fish habitat at a local reservoir. Today we're out on the Michigami Reservoir uh, north of Crystal Falls um, with my wife Diane and uh, we're taking in a little bit of walleye fishing from the, the fish cribs that uh, we helped with uh, for the last three years out here. We're really proud of being involved with uh, Wildlife Unlimited of Iron County and, and uh, partaking of this fish crib project. Um, we've done it for the last three years and we're looking forward to doing it for three more years uh, in cooperation with uh, the Wisconsin Electric power companies and uh, the Michigan DNR uh, division and the Crystal Falls office in particular. The reservoir that we're on today is a 7,300 acre impoundment. Um, it holds uh, every species of fish out here. Um, the, uh, the drawdown occurs in the late fall of the year and the Wisconsin Electric will draw this down um, approximately 15 feet. And in doing that, it uh, wipes out a lot of the structure for the small fish to hide in and pooling them up into the bigger water with uh, the bigger fish. So by providing the structure, it helps uh, give them a place to hide uh, when the shallow water is being uh, taken away. Well, there was no doubt that these fish cribs were holding fish. And although we hadn't caught any monsters just yet, the fishing was steady, catching a mix of pike and walleye. It was nice to reap the benefits of all the hard work put into this project over the winter months. With the crew process, uh, we got a grant from Wisconsin Electric and we purchased a, a semi-load of logs uh, that were six to eight inches in size, maple, um, eight foot long. And of course we do this in the dead of winter when the ice is the thickest and we're able to get trucks and trailers out here and volunteers. If it weren't for the volunteers, we wouldn't be able to do this project because the volunteers is what makes it happen. Um, there was anywhere between 30 and 35 people out here, in particular this past winter, in 20 mile an hour winds, 20 below zero, making this happen. We spent about four and a half hours, and the night before we were out here prepping, putting sandbags out in anticipation of this. 
Um, the logs came in early in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, and uh, uh, the log driver, Brian Carrillo, was able to load all the logs onto our trailers for us, so we were able to haul them out here quite easily instead of having to double handle them. And then uh, another gentleman, uh, Matt, was out here with the cherry picker, and he was able to help us set some of the logs as well to, to keep some of the lifting off. But basically, we were making log cabins, uh, eight by eight feet by five feet high, with a, a number of slab wood running through them and uh, about uh, 600 pounds of sandbags on each one of the cribs to weight them down so that when the ice gets rotten in the spring, it'll uh, rip these cribs through. There's uh, three years of fish cribs out here spread out over three different areas, and there's approximately 22 fish cribs at each site to provide uh, cover for uh, smaller fish to hide in. These fish cribs are meant to be enjoyed by all anglers, and once you have a general idea where they are, they're pretty easy to see on the graph. One of the main goals of this project was to ensure ample fishing opportunities for all levels of fishermen, with creating chances for youngsters and families to get outdoors, taking first priority. We're really happy about being able to help um, continue fishing for families, for kids, for, for many years to come. And uh, by doing this project, it, it gives people a, a, a good structure, a place to find a fish. The, we, you know, we don't hide where the walleye cribs are at. You can come out here with the GPS and GPS them so, so you'll know where they're at for summertime fishing like we're doing today and um, work around the edge of the cribs. Uh, it, you know, if any books that you read on fish, you're gonna find that they're on, in, or around structure. They, they don't just coexist in the lake. There's, there's a reason they're there. They have. They want houses just like you and I live in, actually. They, they want something to cling to, and that's what these cribs provide. There's a lot of work that's associated with actually getting these fish cribs in the water. It takes several different partnerships to make it all possible. However, the future is looking bright, with more fish cribs slated to be added over the next three years. We're really blessed to have uh, good partners with uh, the DNR, uh, Mark Milcrest and uh, Jake and Jody, uh, the fish technicians in uh, the Crystal Falls office in particular, have partnered up with Wildlife Unlimited. And uh, the, the next three years, uh, we, we're going to be working together and we're inviting any other clubs that want to help us, whether it be uh, Trout Unlimited or Wildlife, uh, or excuse me, the uh, Walleye Clubs, uh, the musky clubs, uh, you know, we're, we're welcome everybody to, to help with this. My wife and I spent uh, two weeks after this project last winter, we went over and helped the DNR put some more fish cribs out on uh, Chicago and Lake last year and partnered up with more clubs. And it's just a nice thing when everybody can work together for a, for a common cause to help out, the, help out the environment and for fishing for many years to come. So we, we invite anybody who wants to help us to get in touch with me. Um, at, at any time and help us with this project in the future. We didn't set the fishing world on fire today, but we did manage to catch several walleye and a couple of pike. It's nice to see the hard work of volunteers paying off to improve our fishing landscape. Special thanks to Dave and Diane Grondin for letting me tag along on a beautiful day here in Michigan's Out of Doors. Well, in this next story, we want to show you a little bit about the rich history of fishing here in the state of Michigan. James Ford and Jenny Olson recently teamed up to bring us a story on a lure collector that has one of the coolest lure collections you've ever seen. Visit your local bait shop and the fishing lure selection will look something like this. From spoons to jigs, plugs to plastic body baits, you'll find a collection of finely machined and finely tuned fishing tackle. You won't see any wood-carved, hand-painted baits here. The only way to see a wide selection of classic lures is to go to a collector, a collector like Mark Martin. Mark, a carpenter by trade, created a collection so big he had to build a room in his house with custom wood cases just to hold them all. He didn't start out with great ambitions, just a few lures here and there, but soon it took on a life of its own. I started in our old house that we used to live in and I just started hanging them on a little piece of trim around the top of the den and then when I got one row complete I started the second one and when I moved here I built that room for my lure collection. It's unusual to see that many lures in one place and displayed and uh, most of the guys who fish, you know, they immediately zero in on a bunch of lures that they've used in their life and uh, but women think they're beautiful. I mean they just think they're very artistic and they're pretty impressed with them too. One of the coolest things that you can do is go to a garage sale and find something like this. This is a tackle box I got. I opened it and I saw 
the, all the lures in boxes, and I immediately made them a, an offer, and they accepted it. And I had no idea what was under it, but it turns out that some reels that I had been wanting for a long time were inside these Fluger Summit reels, which they're, they're like brand new in the box, in the bag, with the tools. And these are some of the most well-made reels. This reel was made from, I believe, 1903 to 1910. This is my favorite part of my lure collection. Uh, all, the, all the lures on the glass shelves are Bud Stewart lures, and he lived in Fenton, Michigan most of his life. That's where he had his business, and he hand-carved these lures, hand-painted every one of them. Uh, he's very famous for these little dots that he put inside of other dots with repelling paints to create these interesting designs on everything. And I've tried to uh, collect lures that are signed by him. This one he actually signed twice. I think he signed it once and then found out he had to put the hook there and signed it again. So that's kind of different. Uh, <clears throat> the oldest lures that I have of his, this is one of his lures that he made in 1930 and one of his first lures, hand carved, and it still has the rubber inner tube tail on it. Uh, he's, he's in the Smithsonian Institute. He's just a really iconic lure carver. And he did some really interesting things. Over on this end, there's a, a red wing blackbird, a crippled red wing blackbird that he only made about four of those. And uh, that's a, a very unusual lure he made turtles and muskrats and ducks and all kinds of things for musky fishing. These lures on these two rows are called Devon lures and like this one has, it's made of little stacks of leather. This one is actually sewn uh, into a little shape of a fish with leather. Some of these are actually just turn of the century from the very, very early 1900s. So this cabinet right here is all, almost all heading. Uh, lures and, and I specifically enjoy the crazy crawlers and the tad polys and then the crazy crawlers with the wings um, hadn't bought a patent from another gentleman that was making this and and his name was Jim Donnelly and he called them the Donnelly Wows and there are very few of them in here that have Donnelly hardware that they purchased from him that was different than their own and uh, so those are even more rare because they didn't get much of his hardware these are topwater lures that when you jerk them across the water they splash with those wings and that's a bass lure. Uh, there are a few in here that are quite unique. These three are not are the only ones here that are not headings and these are Kentucky bass birds but they were advertised at, on eBay as airplane lures and didn't have any description of Kentucky Bait Company or anything so I got them really inexpensively because they weren't they didn't know what they were selling, so that's always a good thing. This is kind of my workbench area, just the lures that I've gathered and I'm not sure what I'm doing with yet or whatever. There's some, some, some unique things here too. There's like, this is called a mercury minnow and it actually has a little, you can actually see it in there, a little, some little beads of mercury in it to help it wobble when, it, um, when, when you're pulling the lure through the water. Now this right here, this is another Bud Stewart. This is actually a muskrat pike decoy and it actually has real muskrat fur on it. I just haven't gotten it over there in the in the uh, Bud Stewart area but it's got a funny little face on him and little eyebrows and stuff so it's pretty 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 cute little lure. Now these are real old poppers uh, handmade hand painted. Um, you used to be able to get a dozen of these in a, at, at a time out of a tackle box and now they're sold individually online for a lot more than the whole dozen would have cost 20 years ago. Mark's not just a collector, he's a fisherman and a family man. He practically raised his family on Lake Michigan and has proof that he can not only collect lures, but use them to catch fish so big, well, you just might be tempted to kiss them. When he's not collecting, fishing, or building custom cabinets as his trade, he's creating some really amazing custom painted tiles he frames and sells at outdoor fairs. Mark is a busy man for sure, working, fishing, and building an impressive collection of classic lures. But more importantly, he and his family have collected memories that will last a lifetime in Michigan's out of doors. 
Thanks for joining us this week for Michigan Out of Doors. Make sure you check us out online. If you get a chance, you can do that a couple of different ways. You can check us out on our website at michiganoutofdoorstv.com or you can visit us on our Facebook page at Michigan Out of Doors TV. We've got a lot of fun stuff coming up for you yet this summer on Michigan Out of Doors. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by, by Rosie Brothers. Located in Dryden, Michigan, Rosie Brothers has been serving Michigan for over 40 years. Specializing in outdoor needs, Rosie Brothers features Kubota tractors and equipment for use in farm, home, or commercial needs. On the web at rosiebrosinc.com. By Pictured Rocks Boat Cruises of Munising, exploring Lake Superior's Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore with its sandstone cliffs, caves, waterfalls, and lighthouses. Pictured Rocks Boat Cruises on the web at picturedrocks.com. By Propane, exceptional energy. Propane retailers promote the safe use of Michigan-produced gas energy in homes, farms, and businesses across our great state. Learn more at usemichiganpropane.com. By Meyer, a destination for hunting, fishing, and camping. From bug spray and tents to GPS and gas, Meyer has nearly everything you need to take on nature and get you there. Meyer. Closed captioning is brought to you by Propane Exceptional Energy. Propane retailers promote the safe use of Michigan-produced gas to outdoor enthusiasts across our great state. When I want a far away, a dream stays with me night and day. It's the road that leads to my home state. I am a Michigan man. Changing seasons paint the scene like rainbow trout in a hidden stream. The white-tailed deer in the tall pine tree. I am a Michigan man I am, I am a Michigan man Ask where I'm from and I'll show you my hands Lord above, I love this land I am a Michigan man From the Keweenaw down to St. Joe Kalamazoo, east to Monroe to St. Mar